2 Timothy chapter number 4. We begin reading verse number 1. The Apostle Paul, about ready to depart this world for glory, is giving some final instruction to his son in the faith. A young man, he'd won to the Lord, he'd trained in the Lord. This young man is now a pastor, and Paul is leading, leaving him with some words of wisdom and some direction for the future. And he says this in verse number 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Let me just stop right there. The Lord's going to do the judging. We don't need to. Uh, the Bible says, who, who are you to judge another man's servant? Uh, somebody that belongs to God, it's God's business, and God will judge that person at his appearing. Uh, you and I have no business judging another b believer. Uh, I know a uh, super spiritual Baptist said, well, you can, you can judge a tree by the fruit it bears. Yeah, but you can't look what's inside the tree. And that's none of your business. That's all the Lord's business. And if you just walk a mile in their shoes, you'd realize uh, there's a whole lot more going on than what you would have ever known. And so it's uh, good, sta good standing to do this. Just judge yourself and let them and the Lord handle their life. Amen? That'll help you. All right? Uh, it'll help our churches if we quit looking around judging folks and we just start looking within. Well, that went over good too. It's going to be a long message. <laughs> Verse number 2 says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Let's pray. Our Father, we bless your holy name. We're thankful for those days you burden our hearts with Isaacs that are in the way, and Lord, you have given us victory to lay them down and replace it with more of thee. God, we are thankful for your good grace and your mercy, your tender mercy, your loving kindness. Lord, your grace beyond measure that you would look upon dead dogs such as we and love us and forgive us and make us part of your family. Father, we are eternally grateful. We are ever humbled at the thought, and we sure do bless your holy name. Now, Father, you know better than I all that these people have faced this week. Lord, you know they're down-sitting, they're uprising. You know the pressures, the problems that life will throw at them. You know everything that they have confronted and faced and all that they are dealing with even this morning. Lord, it is a tremendous miracle that we're even able to put aside all that we faced and be able to come and for a few minutes try and put our minds on Thee. And God, I pray for the next few minutes you would honor these folks for attending your house today with your presence and your power. And I pray you'd speak to our hearts, you would enlighten our minds, you would illuminate our, our minds to thy truth. And I pray that, Lord, you would certainly help us to leave uh, uh, ready to face whatever the next week uh, will befall upon us. And God, help us, equip us, and then God, encourage us and edify us that we would leave with victory and with joy and strength. And God, we would leave different than we came in. Meet every need of every heart. I pray especially for those who may be in our attendance today who are lost, who are not saved. I pray for them. I pray the Holy Ghost would convict them of their sin. And I pray we'd see them born again. I pray for those that are believers today. God, you would just certainly help them. And God, you do a great work in our midst today. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for the two that were saved at the jail this morning. Thank you for a good Sunday school hour. Thank you for good singing, good fellowship. And thank you for being a good God. Bless now. Use this unworthy vessel. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention to a couple things for introduction. I want you to notice, first of all, the task that the great apostle leaves this young pastor. 
Look in verse number 2. He says, Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. What a task, what a mouthful. Paul didn't tell Timothy, uh, do a bunch of dramas and give folks a visual that they'll be able to understand it better. Because Paul knew that the just shall live by faith. Amen. We don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. Amen. And Paul told him to preach the word. I am convinced of this thing, being saved now 45 years, that the only thing going to propel us through darkness, the only thing that's going to help our foundation to keep from crumbling, uh, the only thing that's going to help us to face life and the pressures and the problems that befall us uh, is the Word of God. Uh, it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It is the absolute final authority of our life. Uh, and without God in His Word, we're in a mess. He said, preach the Word to them. He said, be instant in season and out of season. When you feel like it, when you don't feel like it, preach the word. When they receive it, when they don't receive it, preach the word. When you're giving them all you got and they look at you like a deer looking in, staring in headlights, uh, preach the word. Uh, when you lay it out there and they don't receive it, preach the word. Because it does impact. Sometimes it's planting time. Sometimes it's watering time. Sometimes you use the Word of God like a hammer and you're busting up some stuff. But preach the Word. He says to do this with the Word. What a task. He says reprove. That means tell people oh, when they've not done right. Reprove them with the Word. Hmm? Rebuke them. When they're openly sinning, let them know. And then exhort them. Preach to them. Urge them. Encourage them. Edify them. Lift them up. Give them something that will help them with all long suffering and doctrine. And he said, Suffer long. Why? Because he suffered long with us. Sometimes you just got to put up with one another. Hmm? It's kind of like Kevin and Sheila. They just got married. He lost the wedding ring. She still put up with him, but he found the ring. What a blessing. And that is going to make Glendale and Dougie. You know that, don't you? It's all good. But he's just been at it. Hey, they just getting married. Some of you have been married a long time. I'm going to tell you what the wise elf told me the other night. He said, there's his ring, there's her ring, and there's suffering. That's what he said. I didn't say that. Is that the foster household? It's all good. Been good 30 years. I have no complaints. I have married up. Sometimes you just have to endure some stuff. That's why he told him earlier, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He said, with, with doctrine. That's a dirty word now. Everybody wants to come together and don't use doctrine. You know what doctrine really is? The study of the Bible. It's what God says. And see, we live in a day and age where people don't want what God says, and that's why I said, here's your task. Preach the Word. Notice, if you will, the times. In verse number 3, he says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Paul is looking ahead. In the chapter before this, he says, uh, uh, perilous times shall come. In the last days, perilous times shall come. Here he says, the time's going to come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Can I help you with something? Those times are now. We are living in the last days, according to the Bible. We're there. We're living in a day where people don't want truth. They don't want the Word of God. They want their ears tickled. They want to be told they're doing a good job. They want to be told everything's okay. You can live however you want to and still get to go to heaven. People want to be told how wonderful they are. Now listen, you are wonderfully made. It is a miracle, the human body. 
God formed you and fashioned you and created you in his own image. And in spite of what sin has done to this world, and in spite of the fact you were conceived in sin, God does love you just as you are. Amen. But it goes much farther than that. If you're going to come to God, you must come to God on God's terms, not your terms. But we live in a day and age where man wants God on their terms. I'll never forget, shortly after Miss Annette and I got married, we lived over off Ewing Boulevard in some apartments that were at that time called the Vineyard. Now I don't know what they're called. They're called something else. They were brand new. Uh, we, we moved in there, we just got married, and we weren't married long, and right across the street where that little business college was, there was a church going in there, just started, called the Vineyard. Isn't it amazing? I lived across the street from it, and now I, lived, uh, now I worship down the street from it. Isn't it amazing, huh? <laughs> but I'll never forget, they sent out a mailer when they opened up, and the mailer for the Vineyard Church said, Come as you are, even in your pajamas. I'm thinking, they don't want to see me in my pajamas. <laughs> uh, uh, can I say that's been almost 30 years? Because today's so-called Christianity don't want Bible Christianity. Amen. The Bible says, be ye holy for I am holy. Right. Not wear holy pajamas to the house of God. Right. Never forget when he was the old building. Brother Rod brought me a postcard he got. I still got it in my desk, I believe. It, it had this real modern-looking lady on there. Uh, kind of looked like uh, the late 60s movement. She had a bob haircut, had uh, 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 the maxi boots on and a short skirt and all that, and invited us to their church. Uh, and their church is not your grandma's church. You know what they were saying? What grandma had's old-fashioned, it's out of date. Get with the times. And Paul said that times are coming. When they're not going to endure sound doctrine. That's why you've got to preach the word. Because there's coming a time when it's not going to be preached. Because they'll have itching ears. How many of you work with people that will tell you, oh, I watched Joe Olstein and got some encouragement, or I watched Joyce Myers and got some encouragement, or I watched T.D. Jakes and got some encouragement, or I bought that holy water from that guy with the bad dye job on his hair, you know, come out of Israel, and it's anointed out of Mount Sinai, and it'll heal all your aches and pain. They all watch something that isn't based on truth. Amen. Mm. I think that guy's name's Popoff or something. Uh, but listen, we see the times. We see the task. Now notice the turning. Look at verse number four. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And that's where we live. You can tell people the truth and they look at you like you're nuts. Can I say it takes more faith to believe what some of those nuts are preaching than it does to believe the Bible. But they'll turn their ears from truth to believe fables. It's the same thing in the political arena. It don't matter how much facts you can show people, they don't care. They want to believe what they want to believe. And we live in that way uh, in the religious world. It don't matter how much Bible you show them. They're going to believe what grandma taught them. They're going to believe what some nut job is teaching down here on the corner. Uh, they're going to believe uh, 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 what somebody else says because it makes them feel good. Well, I got to reading this, thinking about all this. And I want to look at what it said there in verse 4. They'll turn their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. I want to preach with what we're faced with today. We are faced with fable Christianity. Fable Christianity. Let me say something about fable Christianity. Can I say, first of all, fable Christianity is feeble Christianity. Uh, boy, it may sound good, but there's no substance to it. You know why they have to have so many movements 
I mean, the charismatic movement uh, has had movements uh, for the last 20 years. Uh, they had the My Utmost for My Highest movement. They had the 40 Days of Purpose movement. Uh, they had What Would Jesus Do movement. Uh, they had the Frog movement, Fully Rely on God. Uh, uh, now they're in the drama movements. Uh, they, uh, they're in the movie, movie movements. Uh, they're in all these movements. You know why they have to keep having these movements? Because they don't give people truth and they have to sustain their people. They have to keep their crowd, so they have to keep giving them something that appeals to their flesh because they have no substance. By the way, it's not only in the charismatic movement. We have an independent Baptist church in our area that did the 40 Days of Purpose movement, and all that was was glorified humanism. It wasn't based on substance, truth, the Word of God. Fable Christianity is feeble Christianity. What happens is a lot of these charismatic churches, they turn their crowd over so much, and a lot of Southern Baptist churches and folks are leaving to go other places. And why they keep roaming and going to all these different places is they have no substance, no foundation, and they're feeble. Nothing works in their life. Larry Seal said it behind this pulpit years ago. He said, you can light a dog on fire and it'll run for a while. And say, boy, when they get in there and they're excited about this movement, it's great for a while until life hits them and they have nothing to fall back on. It's a feeble Christianity. Can I say it's a foolish Christianity? It's foolish to put your faith in man and not God. Can I say something else? It is a fleshly Christianity. It appeals to the glorification of the flesh. I got news for you. Your flesh is rotten to the core and it's going back to the dust of the earth. You better have something that is sustenance for your soul. Mm, because, my dear friends, if all you're looking for is gratification of the flesh, it never is satisfied. So let's look at some feeble Christianity. Can I say, first of all, feeble Christianity has a Christianity without Christ. Can I say, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He said, keep what I said. Learn of me and do what I say. Go where I say go. Follow where I say follow. Take up your cross and follow me. Uh, 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 lay, uh, live uh, uh, in contentment. Uh, live in godliness. Uh, live in holiness. Uh, uh, be sober, righteous, godly, sin, present world. Uh, don't worry about what the world says is popular. Uh, uh, live by me. But can I say Christianity, this feeble Christianity doesn't have Christ. It's all based on them. Oh, listen to the, the lyrics of their songs. Doesn't have any Jesus in it. Sure. Listen to what they teach. It doesn't have any Jesus in it. All it says a lot about Lord, says a lot about God. You can go to an AA meeting and they'll tell you you can make anything be your God. But it's a different thing to make Jesus your Lord. Amen. Feeble Christianity is a Christianity without Christ. Can I say they have a Bible without truth? God wrote one Bible. And the Bible says we're begotten by an incorruptible seed. Not a corruptible seed, an incorruptible seed. Amen. All you got to do to see if uh, your Bible was written by God or not, look in the front and see if it's got a copyright. Hmm. You know why they sell all them perverted Bibles? Because they're making money on them. Yeah. Amen. And somebody's getting paid. You know why the King James Bible doesn't have a copyright? Because God wrote it. And God gets the glory for it. That was a blessing when I was down there preaching at camp meeting in September. They got that big campground. It's fancy. And they raised the money to fix it all up. It's been down there 60 years. And the, and the moderator of the meeting told me that that camp and the grounds it was on was deeded to God. That blessed me. Huh? How you gonna, how you going to go and uh, uh, mess with that? God owns it. Hmm? It was deeded to God. I was like, hallelujah. What a blessing. Huh? I think that'd be a good thing. We we get our mortgage paid off. We had to deed this thing to God. Wouldn't that be a blessing? No. Uh, let them come and try and take it then. Take it up with God. He owns it. Amen. I like it. Amen. Uh, but see, they have a Bible without truth. They say things like this. This is what the Bible means. No, God wrote what He meant. They'll say stuff like this. Well, it contains the Word of God. No, it is the Word of God. 
It don't contain it. It is it. Every jot and tittle. They'll say our book has errors. No. Uh, uh, our book, uh, uh, my dear friend, is inerrant. It's infallible. It's God breathed. Uh, uh, and God said not to add to or take away from the Word of God. Uh, can I say this about feeble Christianity? It has a church without authority. They're part of associations and assemblies. And can I say a lot of these places don't even have a pastor. They have a satellite simulcast and you watch it on video screen. Can I say Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it? Can I say the church is made up of baptized believers? It is a local assembly. Can I help you with something today? The head of this church is not Doug Foster. It is Jesus Christ. It was built upon him and his foundation. And uh, uh, my dear friends, uh, uh, listen, uh, 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 if you have no uh, 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 church authority, you have no church. I'm the pastor of this church, but the church has the authority. Amen. Every ministry of this church is the church's authority. But see, they have organizations and they call them churches. I'm glad a lot of them, they're calling fellowships now instead of churches. That's all they are. Can I say this? They have a salvation without change. Can I say you cannot be saved unless you have repented and turned from your sin. If you made a confession and there was no change in your life, you didn't get saved. Hmm? The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Former things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I'm not the same man that Jesus found 45 years ago. He changed me when he saved me. He forgave me of my sin, sealed me with the Holy Spirit of God. He robed me in his righteousness, and he changed me. I'm glad he did, huh? He changed my desires and my wants to. Want to. Before I got saved, all I thought about was uh, playing baseball. After I got saved, I couldn't help but think about Jesus. Are you listening? Before I got saved, I had to go to church. After I got saved, I got to go to church. There's a difference. He saved me and he changed me. Before I got saved, we'd sing them songs. They were just songs. After, after I got saved, they meant something. Before I got saved, I, I only read the Bible so I could tell my Sunday school teacher how many chapters I read. But after I got saved, I got to read the Bible and understand it. And it was God talking to me. See, feeble Christianity has a salvation without change. Can I say, all they talk about is, do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe? I believe God. I believe God. I believe. I, believe. I caution you that the Bible says the devils believe and they fear and tremble. It's not enough to believe in God. It's not enough to believe in Jesus. It's not enough to believe that Jesus died for your sins. It's not enough to believe that Jesus rose again from the grave. It's not enough to believe it. You've got to accept it and realize He did that for you personally and it was your sins that sent Him to the cross and you need to repent and ask Him to forgive you of your sins. If you believe that in your heart, that's what happened and He changed your life. Can I say this? They have a forgiveness without repentance. They'll have a big congregation and they'll say, if you want to believe in God, lift up your hand. They lift up your hand and they tell them they got saved. There was no repentance. Amen. They didn't realize that Jesus really died for their sin and it was their sin that caused him to go to the cross. They don't realize, uh, 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 my dear friend, that they are the enemy of God. They're at enmity with God and God is angry with the wicked every day and they're going to die and go to hell uh, if they don't repent and trust the Lord. Jesus said, repent or you shall all likewise perish. They just say, just believe, just believe, just believe. Repeat after me. One, two, three, and now you're saved. No, it's more than that. You've got to realize you were going the wrong direction, and you've got to turn from that and turn to the Lord. That's what repentance is. It's a turning point. When you realize everything you've trusted in is wrong, you might have not even been raised in church. You didn't trust in anything. Uh, but you realize, hey, this isn't the right way. And you turn and put your faith in Jesus. And I say this, feeble Christianity has sin without consequences. They tell you it's okay to be a sinner. Just keep on sinning. God loves you anyway. Well, God does love sinners. But God doesn't accept sin. And there are consequences for sin even for believers. 
you shall you, you'll reap what you sow. Amen, and yet, they say, just live it up. Can I say that's the devil's philosophy? Sure. If it feels good, do it. Mm. That's why some of you go to church with folks that don't have any problems going to the bars on Saturday night and getting drunk. You know who can't go to a bar on Sunday, Saturday night and get drunk and get away with it? A believer. Because the Holy Ghost living inside you will tell you that's wrong. And then if you ignore him and grieve him and go ahead and do it, you, you realize there's a consequence for it. You'll be out of fellowship with God. Sin has its consequences. Told you this message is going to be long. Some of you are about to pass out. You might just have a feeble Christianity. Can I say this? Feeble Christianity has church membership without accountability. You know why that church covenant's up there? Because that's what we agree to when we're members. We're accountable one to another because we're fitly framed together. But see, the reason they got them big mega churches, you can show up whenever you want to and nobody cares. There's no accountability. But the, guy, but the Bible says in stewards it's required that a man be fa found faithful. Paul said be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I was just teaching in my Sunday school class in Acts chapter 2. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Hmm. Oh boy, that went over good about being faithful. Amen. But feeble Christianity, you don't have to be. Amen. But real Christianity, you do. Sure. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together so much as the manner is. Amen. I know when you're providentially hindered, God understands that. But you're not providentially hindered every Sunday night. You're not providentially hindered every Wednesday night. Sometimes God's going to open the door for you to be able to be in, in His house. Amen. You're welcome. Didn't cost you anything. You might just have a little feeble Christianity in you. Can I say this? Feeble Christianity has sanctuary without reverence. Can I say this place has been hallowed to the name of the Lord? Amen. This is His house. When we come here, we ought to come here in a spirit of reverence. Mm -mm. I want to tell you something. If you've got to drag your coffee and your donuts in a sanctuary, it ain't a sanctuary. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had members that have, have sugar problems and would come and ask permission. It's okay, preacher, if I have a little piece of candy in case my sugar bottoms out. That's different. But there are people who pay disrespect the place is called a house of God. It's not a house of God if it's not a place of reverence. Uh, I remember when Jesus made a three-quarter whip and drove the money changers out because they were not respecting the house of God. Uh, they have a sanctuary without reverence because it's feeble Christianity. There's nothing to it. It's more than watered down. It's feeble. And Paul said, preach the word. Time's coming. They're not going to endure sound doctrine. They're going to turn their way, ears away from the truth unto fables. Fable Christianity has a sanctuary without reverence. Can I say this? They have enjoyment without joy. Did you ever watch some of their services on TV? They're jumping up and down like a bunch of jackrabbits. Lord, have mercy. I would to God, God would get on us so much we'd get to jumping around. But it's all emotionalism. And they show them having a time. But there's no joy. We find the joy of the Lord's our strength. I can be having the worst day ever, but deep down inside I have joy because I realize I ought to be in hell and I'm not going. Mm -mm. Some of y'all, it'd be good if you'd let some of that joy work its way out to your face so you'd smile a little bit. Can I say fable Christianity have hymns without him? You know why we still use the hymn book? Because them songs were written by people that knew about him, and them songs are all about him. Mm -mm. There's something about singing hymns and spiritual songs and making melody in your heart. By the way, that's preaching the word. Oh, yeah, we could get a big screen and put them up there. 
but there's something about a hymn book. Can I say something? There are two books you ought to have in your life, your Bible and a hymn book. Sure. They'll help you get through life. Amen. The Lord will give you a song in due season. Sure. There is a, a garment uh, of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Thank God for some of them old hymn writers. Some of them were blind, but oh, they could write some hymns. Some of them were invalids, but they wrote some hymns. Some of them faced some of the greatest adversity, but they found Jesus never forsook them at all. And they penned it down, and it would encourage your soul. We sang that hymn earlier about a beautiful life. Thank God you can have a beautiful life. But you can if you were basing it on fable Christianity. Let me say this lastly. Fable Christianity has a heaven without hell. They all want to go to heaven. They all talk about heaven. But listen to what they talk about. They talk about mansions and streets of gold and walls of jasper and gates of pearl. Can I say that's not heaven? Heaven is him and his throne. All the other things are just byproducts. Hmm? I mean, you got nice clothes on today. Did you get up thanking God for all them stitches in them clothes? That's all mansions and gold are. That's the stitches. The real deal is Jesus and his throne. Hmm? Uh, Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Hmm? God help us. They want heaven. They don't don't talk about hell. I'll never forget years ago we put out the preaching tapes in the neighborhood, the reality of hell. You say, did it work? Brother Kevin's here. He got one of them. Uh, Miss Gloria's in heaven. She got one of them. Mm. Uh, there are others that got them. One one young man got three of them before he ever came to church. You know what happened? He came and got saved. Mm. You say, what are you talking about, preacher? And we put that, that tape out to Reality Hill in one of these uh, uh, fable Christianity churches. The pastor had to get up and say, well, there's some Baptist church putting out me- a message on hell. And all you keep asking about it, so I guess I've got to preach on hell today. That tickled my soul. At least, he, at least he had to get up and admit there's a hell, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Say, so how do you know that? Because one of their members knows one of our members and told them. <laughs> they don't want to talk about hell. Can I help you? Something? A lot of Baptist preachers don't preach on hell anymore. I got a friend who keeps promising to come. He says, but as soon as you come, you're going to preach on hell. I said, I'll purposely not preach on hell unless Jesus tells me to. Can I say Jesus preached on hell twice as much as he preached on heaven? They want heaven without hell. That's what the world wants. The world wants to see a great light and go to this peaceful place. Isn't it amazing? Everybody that dies in the world, they all go to heaven. They're all looking down on us. They're all meeting with us. They're all talking with us. I got news for you. A lot of people end up in hell. And a lot of people are leaving church pews and going to hell because they're in a place of fable Christianity. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. And by the way, when he founded it, it was not about collecting goods so when somebody's house burns down, they can get them a hotel room and get them goods. It was about taking the gospel to a lot of folks that were homeless and a lot of folks that didn't have any hope. It was a salvation army. It was the Christian folks getting together and taking the gospel out. And then they started helping meet needs. But in 1890, at the latter end of his life, this is what William Booth said. He said, the chief danger of the 20th century, we're now in the 21st century, the chief danger of the 20th century will be religion without the Holy Spirit. Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. He said that in 1890. Paul said in about AD 70, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they'll turn their ears away from the truth and be turned unto fables. He said, preach the word. Because there's a fable Christianity coming. That day is upon us. You may be here today. And you have put your faith in something other 
than Jesus Christ. I exhort you to do what Paul said to the church at Corinth. 2 Corinthians 13.5 Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobates. Word reprobate means tested out worthless. And if you're here today and you're not saved and you don't know Jesus, when it comes to the things of God, you test out worthless. You are just feeble and fabled. My dear friends, don't die and go to hell. Don't let religion rob you of a relationship with Almighty God who loved you and died for you. You can be saved today. So many people put their faith in a lot of things that are popular today. Friend, put your faith in Jesus. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Amen. He'll never fail you, never forsake you. Put out on the sign, because Brother Tommy told me his mom wanted to see Scripture on the sign, ye must be born again. Amen. Are you born again? If not, today be a good day. If you're here today and you're saved, you ought to thank God you're in a good Bible preaching church. Maybe you know somebody that's in a fabled church. You ought to come pray for them. Say, God, open their eyes to truth before it's everlasting too late. Let's all stand, brother. Ray, you come. Get a song of invitation. As folks are coming. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth. Lord, we'd be in a mess without it. We'd be in some false church somewhere. But God, I fear we'll pound our chest that we have the truth, but we don't spread the truth. We don't live the truth. God, help us to be instruments of truth and righteousness. Help us to share abroad the wonderful, glorious good news that Jesus saves sinners. God, there may be somebody here today that's lost. I pray you'd open their eyes and help them to come and accept the Lord. Maybe there's folks here that are saved, but they're just anemic. They need to be refueled in the things of God. I pray you'd revive them, do something tremendous for them. There may be some here today, just as we preached a few weeks ago, and they're just numb. I pray you'd do something good for them today. Help us, Lord. Without you, we can do nothing. We do need your touch. We need your help. Because we live in those times that Paul preached about. So God, give us grace. And help us, we pray. Bless this invitation. Speak to hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.